Welcome to Chalk Across America. I'm Doug Miles, and we're here in beautiful Sarasota, Florida. And joining us now on our Book Talk segment, great to welcome, uh, author of a very fascinating book about really one of our most interesting presidents. It's called T.R.'s Last War, Theodore Roosevelt, The Great War and a Journey of Triumph and Tragedy. We're joined today by uh, David Petruzzi. Of course, he's written so many great books about uh, politics, also uh, uh, some sports as well. But he joined us by telephone today from up in New York. And David, good to talk with you. How are you? Good to talk to you. I'm doing fine. Yeah, I, we just started thinking as I read through the book uh, about Teddy Roosevelt, uh, one of our class trips uh, when he went to elementary school was to go out and see his home in Sagamore Hill in Long Island. Uh, that was one of the great That's, places to visit. <laughs> That's right. And even as an adult, they, they just fixed it up a few years ago. And I kept trying to visit it, and it was always closed. And then I finally got there. But it, it's, an, it's an amazing sight. And the grounds are much bigger than you would think. I wasn't sure if they still had it. So they still have it open. That's good to know. That was a while ago oh, when yeah. I was a kid. But I mean, <laughs> it was a great place to be. Like you said, he had all these hunting trophies there. And uh, it was large as a kid, but it, you said it's even larger uh, now, right? I mean, they, it looks. Well, they have, a, they have a museum off to the side, and they have opened up as a sort of gallery Ted Jr.'s house. Ted Jr. Uh, built a house a little ways across the field. And. Uh, and so it's, it's sort of like a complex. It's not quite as grand as, as Hyde Park and, and with FDR, right. uh, which, uh, which has a very elaborate museum. Uh, but, and, of course, he had a much longer presidency. And World <laughs> Wars and Depressions uh, sort of trumped uh, square deals and uh, great white fleets. And they, they were related as, what, second cousins? The two no, cousins? much further, five or six. The real relationship there is with Eleanor. Okay. Eleanor Roosevelt is T.R.'s niece. Is that right? Okay. I, I, knew, I knew there was some father, connection, her, but I didn't know it was that. All right. Yeah, her father was Elliot, and he was... T.R. was very Victorian and very straight-laced and very upstanding, and Elliot was none of those things. <laughs> he was an alcoholic and a drug addict, uh, addict and a wastrel, and he dies after having jumped out of the window... I think West 102nd Street of his mistress's uh, apartment. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. T uh, Eleanor adored him, adored him. It was so often the case of, of you know, the, the par of the child adoring the sort of wastrel parent and taking the other one for granted. Yeah, interesting. Well, let's talk about, about the book here again. This is uh, mostly the story of Teddy Roosevelt, of course, during right before World War One. Of course, his uh, sons, uh, right, all four were in World War One. They lost one, too, didn't they? Yes, that's that's Quentin. That's the youngest one. The oldest is, is Ted Jr., who uh, people may remember from the movie The Longest Day, played right. by Henry Fonda. He was in two wars, so was Archie, who was wounded in both wars, uh, and at Kermit uh, uh, goes off and fights with the British in World War One, and then serves in the army, not in combat, but up in Alaska. Um, Quentin does not get to serve in two wars. He's the youngest. He's 20 years old, a sophomore at Harvard when the war begins, and he becomes an aviator which is a, a pilot, a fighter pilot, which is a hell of a risky thing in any war. But particularly in World War I, it's, it's like akin to being a kamikaze because the shelf life, the life expectancy of a new pilot is, I've seen two figures, eight days and 11 days. Wow. And he doesn't make it to 11, and I'm not sure he makes it to eight on his second combat mission. He takes two bullets to the skull, and um, his parents are... are alerted to that, but they're not sure what happens, uh, that the plane is down. They don't know that he's been wounded. They don't know. Maybe he's walked away from the crash. He's walked away from crashes before. Is he captured or is he dead? And it turns out he's dead. They go through a sort of stiff upper lip sort of facade, but behind that facade, of course, is the immense grief that, that any parents would have. And planes then literally and, were only 10 years old, so I mean the technology of planes were pretty right. rudimentary. Right, TR is the first ex-president to fly in an airplane. He wow. does that in St. Louis after he leaves the presidency. Uh, Quentin had seen planes in Paris when he was visiting there as a kid and fell in, in love with them. Um, uh, I think the first chief of 
date to fly was like the king of Belgium, Belgium or some Belgium, and uh, Florence Harding is the first first lady to fly. So it's all it's all very new stuff and dangerous stuff. And the thing about uh, I think every kid probably you know from the history you learn about Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, but but he actually wanted to go fight himself, get on the front lines. I mean, he, he wanted to go in World yeah, War One, but he, they wouldn't allow him, right? Or he couldn't do it. No, he personally knocks on the door of the White House. People who seem to used to do that and think the president would be there. I just came across an instance this morning of Andrew Carnegie walking to the White House in a snowstorm and finding, and, and, and then, this is the really weird part, finding not that just that Wilson isn't there, they should have called ahead, but that Wilson was golfing in a snowstorm. <laughs> anyway, T.R. goes twice to the White House unannounced. The second time, they kind of know he's coming, though, because you can't keep the secret in Washington. And he personally <laughs> begs Woodrow Wilson for permission to go and fight and lead a volunteer regiment into France, much as he had in Cuba in the Spanish-American War. And Woodrow Wilson is not about to do that. Uh, T.R. is pushing 60. He's overweight. He's still bearing the scars, uh, figuratively, of his uh, expedition to the Amazon and jungle fever. And he's it's a different sort of war. And he's an ex-president now. And how, how would it be if an ex-president were killed in the war or captured for morale? And also... He's kind of an insubordinate kind of guy. <laughs> You're not sure you know, who you he would tell take him what to do. From. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and didn't he have a bullet in him? This is a story I heard where he gave a speech and he got shot and he kept talking, right? Until the speech well, was that's over? Well, that's another thing. Is that, is that yeah. true? <laughs> well, yeah, he's got all, aside from, from age and, and weight, he has a whole bunch of issues health wise at that point. One of which is that in Milwaukee, he's campaigning for the presidency as the Progressive Party candidate. He, he's out on the sidewalk about ready to get into a car, and this crazy former New York City bartender uh, <laughs> shoots him in the chest. And T.R. gets into the car and is driven to the hall and speaks for 80 minutes. Yeah. He had heard when he was in Cuba from someone that if you're shot in the chest and if you're not coughing off bl uh, blood, you're going to be okay, which is like, <laughs> I don't know if that's the soundest theory in the world, but it worked for him. Uh, and he wasn't, and so he, he did that. He was also at that point in 1917-1918, he was blind in one eye. Wow. He loved to box. He boxed as governor of New York. He boxed as president of the United States. And he was boxing like a young naval officer in the White House in 1907 and, and lost the sight in one eye from that. By 1918, which is after he begs Wilson to go in, he has an operation on his year in February 1918 from jungle fever and, and the infections of that, and that operation botches his uh, ear canal, and he loses the equilibrium in that ear, so then he's deaf in one ear, and because the equilibrium is gone, he has to relearn how to walk. So at the end of his life, he's facing all sorts of challenges. And I was a kid, he had the bad asthma, too. I remember that. Uh, yes, uh, he, his, his he life very, sort very of weakly. bookends. Yeah, very sickly, yes, I should it, say. It, yeah. it, it, he, he goes from being the, uh, the kid who can't, cannot breathe at night, who thinks his world is going to end in, in his sleep, and his father says, you've got to build up your body as well as the great mind you have, uh, to being this indestructible figure in the Spanish-American War, or as a ranch hand in the Dakotas, or, or a rancher, uh, or being shot, or surviving the Amazon or African expeditions. And so people think he's indestructible at the end, but he's not. And he's very sick that last year of his life. He spends like the last two and a half months of the last year of his life in, in various hospitals, or in one hospital in Manhattan. The only 60 when he died. People tend to think he lived to be his 80s, but quite young by today's standards. No, uh, yeah. even even for that time period, he's not as, uh, he does not survive as long as a Woodrow Wilson right. or a William Howard Tafter or guys like that. He's, um, 
he, he, he makes, he says to his wife, uh, his uh, sister, his younger sister, when he's in the hospital, and he says, do you remember the promise I made when I was young? And, no, what was that? It's like, I said, I vowed I would live to the hilt until I was 60. And after that, whatever happened. Yeah. And whatever happened was his, his demise. Yeah, he, he, he wore himself out, really. He, he was not cheated. He got everything he could out of it, right? He got a good right. credit. Right, and a broken heart <laughs> from the death of his son. That's and right. as he writes to, as he writes to uh, uh, a woman who knew uh, Quentin, you know, is a terrible thing to a uh, terrible price to pay uh, to have argued for a war and to have your your son die in it. Well, the book is uh, filled with these uh, great historical accounts, and, and you write it almost like uh, a novel. It's, it's fascinating to read. It's called T.R.'s Last War. The Theodore Roosevelt, The Great War and a Journey of Triumph and Tragedy. We're talking with David uh, Petrusia today. And David, do you have a website you can give uh, people to get more information on the book? Yes, www.davidpetrusia.com. Or just go to, say, uh, Amazon, dot, dot, uh, Amazon or Google and type in TR's Last War and you'll find that. And, and if you backtrack around, you can find out some more information about me and my other books. Great. Yeah, we'll also put a link on the website. But yeah, you've written so many of these historical books. And uh, imagine you're working on another one now. I guess, uh, can you tell us what it well, is? Well, we're, we're in negotiations, that? shall we say. Okay. In negotiations. It'll be another historical book, I imagine. But uh, it's an interesting oh, yes. life you have. I mean, you really kind of delve into history. Uh, it must be kind of interesting for you. Well, you do. You sort of lose yourself in, in the process of, of writing those books because you're so deeply into the research and what's going on then, and uh, it's a good antidote to what's going on in the world today. That's right, that's right. David, pleasure talking to you. Please keep in touch, uh, at least through Elise or whoever, and we'd love to have you back when the next book comes out, but thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Talk Across America. Please visit our website at DougMilesMedia.com for more great interviews and content. And if you're interested in any of the books we talk about on the program, please click the Amazon link on our website. It helps support the podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again real soon here from beautiful Sarasota, Florida. I'm Stan Brock. 30 years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America.